So anyway, this uh, trilogy is the story of an embattled queen who uh, has a brutal enemy arrive on her shores and she is uh, forced to, by a, an emperor, by a deal she has with the emperor to try to stop this uh, rebellion that's coming through and stop the uh, brutal conqueror who is known as the slave king. And so in the first book, and, and I hate to spoil it, but you know, you guys came to an event for the second book, so you know what you're getting, right? Uh, in the first book, uh, Queen Euthalia, Leah, uh, at the end, unwillingly, semi-willingly, grudgingly, uh, agrees to a marriage of state with the slave king, Kongri. And so Leah and Khan are married, but it's not, uh, it's not a love match, although they are attracted to each other. So I will read to you from the beginning of The Fiery Crown. And the book opens with uh, Khan's point of view, where he's reflecting on the fact that he's kind of kicking his heels and this island paradise and no closer to taking his ultimate revenge on the emperor who destroyed his kingdom and his family. And now he has, uh, and he's been avoiding court because he's not very good at formal court type things. And so this is the beginning of chapter two, which switches to Leah's point of view. It's an alternating first person point of view between Khan and Leah. So this is the beginning of her point of view. And she has received a message from the emperor. She was supposed to be engaged to the emperor. So by marrying Khan, she has violated that agreement and they've been expecting retaliation. And here comes the retaliation now. With a wary look, Khan took Anya's envelope from me. I had to control the impulse to scrub my hand against my skirt to rid myself of Anier's taint. Even though I would kept his letter pinned in my nails and not touching my skin, I'd loathed having the vile thing near me. And I'd been hard pressed not to show it much, how much its contents had shaken my already tenuous composure. The ice I'd been carefully layering around my heart all these long years of ruling alone had begun to fail me. Too much stress, too much con and his hot headedness. Too many feelings I didn't know how to control. Thus, I was more than happy to hand the letter into Khan's keeping. If only I could is easily rid myself of Anya's words. I'd been reading his crazed and cruel missives for years, but this one had exceeded them all. Somehow crawling under my skin like a filth I could never remove. They corroded my already fragile barriers, making me feel weak. I hated feeling weak. And now Khan just stood there holding Anya's letter instead of instantly reading it, assessing me as if he'd expected something more. Why wasn't he reading the cursed thing? He had been waiting for this moment, practically frothing at the mouth for action since our hasty wedding. Now, when he could act, he did nothing, staring me down. I kept my chin high and my expression composed, refusing to let him intimidate me. My wolf king hadn't tamed much in the days since our marriage. Not that I had expected him to, really. As my consort, however, he could damn well spend a few hours in court to demonstrate he cared about Calanthe and respected my rule. Or at least give the appearance of doing so to silence the snickers of the courtiers who already spun tales that I'd been coerced into this marriage and used by the erstwhile slave king as surely as Anyer had planned to do. As Anyer still planned to do. For every moment you make me wait, he had written. Well, if I had to be married, I should at least have had the comfort of feeling a little less alone. There had been moments 
brief glimpses here and there where it seemed possible that Khan and I could be a team when we'd actually understood each other. Those flashes of harmony shone with bright promise and vanished in the harsh light of morning. In the final analysis, the two of us came from different worlds and I should have realized that Khan wouldn't fit into mine. Even now he stood out in the gardens like a bloody sword thrust through a garland of jasmine, scowling, seething, dressed in unrelieved black, and as always with his rough rock, rock hammer strapped to his back and his bagaroka hanging heavily from his belt. Khan was a warrior spoiling for a fight. I could tell by the look in those golden eyes that he'd happily take that fight with me if I offered the opportunity. I toyed with the idea. I could needle him further to draw him into the argument he so clearly wanted, but I wouldn't give him the satisfaction. He had no business acting like the wounded party. He'd made me have to come to him, and so it was up to him to make it up to me. He had yet to reply to me. I waited him out. I've got something in my eyes, sorry. I waited him out with cold expectation. He might have the strength to break me in half with those big hands if he chose, but politics were a familiar battleground for me. And I knew how to wield my silences like a master. Perhaps, your highness, Khan finally said in his smoke-ruined voice, gravelly and deep, we should discuss the contents of this letter in private. He held the envelope, not moving to open it, steady gaze on mine. I jilted to a halt in my mental dance of triumph. I gained the upper hand by forcing him to speak first, but something was off. The beat of silence extended awkwardly while everyone waited on my reaction, their avid interest practically a scent in the air. Khan and I were still new enough together that our protocols weren't well worked out, and it didn't help that he had turned out to be so obstinate about appearing Oops, lost my place. Appearing in any formal capacity with me. Our public interactions were rare, frequently contentious, and apparently endlessly fascinating to those around us. When he'd first entered my court, had it only been a week, it seemed forever ago, he'd requested a private audience and I'd used that impertinence as a weapon against him. No one had forgotten it naturally. Then there'd been the very public argument over the defense council, which had added new fuel to the gossip wildfire. My court, ever lustful of new entertainment, watched all interactions between Khan and me with gleeful anticipation of more juicy tidbits. I was loath to fuel their hunger further. The silence extended, this one not at all under my control. Khan still returned my gaze with wariness, the leashed violence in his posture betraying his agitation. That was nothing new. How much was aimed at me, however, I couldn't be sure. Great green Idra, why wouldn't he? With the sour crush of chagrin, I realized my error. Khan didn't read well. In my terrible mood and upset at Anya's promised retaliation, which was arguably entirely Khan's fault, I'd forgotten about that. An unforgivable error, really, as Khan couldn't read because he'd been ripped from life as a crown prince of Oriel and forced to labor in the mines of volcanic Vergman. Did he think that I'd intended to humiliate him as payback for his various transgressions? Not that I was above such tricks, but I wouldn't use his past against him. I doubted Khan knew that, however, and I needed to resolve this detente immediately. And I'll stop there. So I will turn on the chat and see if there are questions. Oh, and we do have one already. Ah. 
I don't know what, it was like a cat hair flew into my eye right as I was starting. That's how the cats sabotage these things. What was your favorite point about writing the dialogue between the two main characters? Well, you know, they're both so, so cool and so smart about things. Um, so, yes, I love the banter between the two of them. I love the way that they uh, are continually trying to both understand each other and score points off of each other. So I did very much enjoy that. Uh, it's uh, I, I enjoy dialogue anyway. I enjoy conversations between characters. So having that kind of banter is uh, always a real treat to write between characters who are, I don't know, both very fiery characters. How do you find that balance between love and hate between this kind of relationship? You know, it's a good question. Um, in this case, because this is a real enemies to lovers story, I really wanted them to have a true kind of enmity, have a very real reason why they, uh, why they should hate each other. When Khan first arrives on Leah's island, she takes him prisoner and promises to execute him or turn him over to the emperor to be executed. And she's determined to do that. And he's uh, taken aback that she will really do this. And so they are, they are at odds. And I wanted to have a couple that was truly at odds, not, um, I don't know, you know, like not sort of bickering or having there be a misunderstanding or having one have been like a bully to, to the other. So I think one of the keys in a relationship like this is that even though they have really good reasons to hate each other and they don't understand the other at first, all they really know is what they've heard about the other. Uh, when they meet, they discover that they actually have a great deal in common that they are very much alike under the skin, even though they've had very different upbringings and have very different personalities that in the end, they really want the same things, that they both agree on wanting to destroy the emperor or they disagree on how to do it. But there's um, that they're both very alone in their lives. And so when they meet each other, they recognize in the other that, uh, that deep kinship. And that's, that's really fun to play with because they kind of fall in love with the other in spite of themselves and in spite of all the really good reasons not to. What was the inspiration for the story? Original inspiration. So I'd had this image in my mind. I probably started to say this before and then we had our weird little blip. Um, I'd had this image in my mind for a very long time of a queen standing on a cliff and looking out over the ocean and knowing that her enemy is coming and that her enemy is going to land on her shores and that she has no way of stopping them from arriving and that she's trying to decide how to what to do once they do land and how to deal with that. And so I built, I actually built the story out from that image. That's true for most of my books. I usually have like a, a single image in my mind that I then kind of build out from there. Looking back on Orchid Throne as an entryway to this world, do you remember how the initial idea came about? Well, that's what we just talked about. Yes, um, great minds. Was it a particular character as aspect of the world, the relationship, or a bit of everything? Um, definitely the character of Leah uh, I started with. And then I went from there to who was this guy? Who was this conqueror who was arriving in her land and why? And yeah, I, you know, I'm a write for discovery sort of writer, so I don't plan much out before I actually write. So I originally wrote the story as her point of view. I wrote first person in Leah's point of view. And my agent and I were talking about going out on submission with this story. And so I wrote 
several chapters from Leah's point of view of this queen anticipating the arrival of the brutal conqueror. And from there, she read it and she said, well, that she wanted to know more about him. And could I do some chapters from his point of view? Because I'd had him arriving on the island and uh, we didn't know much about Khan other than what Leah observes. And so I said, well, all right, I'd like to write some chapters from his point of view. And I actually did a survey on social media and asked people, I'm like, okay, so if I have a heroine in first person, do you want, and I was adding in another POV, would you want it first person or a third person? Or would that be weird? Or should I make them both third person? And I really didn't want to take her story out of first person because I really, that was working for me and I liked her voice. So I, people kind of went both ways and I felt like people liked having the hero in third person, having the other POV in third person. So I wrote it that way. I wrote his in third person and I did alternating chapters and we sold the book like that. And then my editor at St. Martin's, uh, when I, cause I wrote like a hundred pages when we sold the trilogy. And then I asked her, well, before I start writing the rest of the book, what, or, you know, do you have any editorial input to start with, you know, so I don't get too far. And she said, well, I really think Khan's point of view should be in first person also. I was like, really? And she said, yes, I think it could work. And she said, because so far it just feels really like Leah's story. And I was like, hello, I feel like it is Leah's story. And she's like, no, but I really want Khan's story in there too. So I ended up having to go back and rewrite all of his chapters in first person. And it did really change the story. It really did change my understanding of him. And so, so I ended up writing it that way. And then, you know, now it's, um, it's no longer just Leah's story. It really is both of their stories. Um, I love the fact that these two are very much a fire and ice couple. They really are um, both very strong and smart. When you wrote the dialogue for the two of them, when they were together, whose head were you in most of the time, Khan's or Leah's? I am in the head of whoever's point of view I'm in. So that's one of the things about writing, uh, you know, like changing from third person to first person point of view. Every once in a while, I'll see some writers say, oh, well, you know, all you have to do is go through and swap out the pronouns. And and that's just so not true. It, yeah, you, you can't just swap out pronouns and verb tenses. Um, not verb tenses, but verb agreements. Um, it's it's a it's a whole different thing because when you are in first person and inside someone's head, there is um it's colored by their perceptions and it's colored by what they understand and and what they think of the other person. So so yeah, whoever's point of view it is, the conversation is absolutely colored by them and what they think because I I do believe that people don't have objectivity right that everything we perceive is subjective it's always colored by how we think and feel so I don't know if if someone who's not me would notice it but there are subtle differences in what Khan and Leah each think that the other has said um, because it is so much filtered through their own perception. Let's see, how many books will be in the series? Three. That's the plan is to have three. Uh, the Promised Queen has already been turned in. I think I mentioned that. And I have the contract for those three, and that comes out next year. If there will be more than that, we don't know. It kind of depends on sales. So um, buy more books. <laughs> buy them for your friends. Make your friends buy them. Uh, I would love to keep going with the world. There are some secondary characters I'd like to explore. But for this, um, for this initial outing into the world, it is the three book series and it's all about Khan and Leah. So the third book's about them as well. And do you have a favorite scene? Oh, 
I, you know, I really love the scenes in the map room. <laughs> <laughs> and Fiery Crown, I really love the scene in the map room. If you've read the book, you know the one that I mean. I actually had to kind of work it in. I don't often feel like I need to insert sex scenes, but there was a particular scene where I really wanted them to be in that room and for the map to be involved. There's a, a tower that has a... Um, ultra realistic map of Calanthe tiled into the floor that magically updates. So it's um, always, always up to date, I guess. Um, and it's very beautiful. And that, that inspires me a whole lot. Um, other than that, let's see, favorite scenes from this particular book. Uh, I am, without being spoilery, I don't know. There are some scenes towards the end that I really love. Um, I really like the scene where they're saying goodbye and you know, the one kisses the other. And I love all of the build up to that final battle scene. Oh, there's lots more questions. Let's see. What first inspired you to become a writer? Was it a specific book or something from your childhood? Um, you know, I didn't think I was going to be a writer. I was always a reader. So it would be hard for me to trace what book made me want to be a writer. Um, I thought I was going to be a scientist. I was getting my PhD in neuroscience and decided I didn't want to be a scientist. <laughs> it was a little late in the game to decide that, but um, I, I was in my early 20s, so it wasn't really that late, but um, I did switch things up and become a writer instead, and I wouldn't say that it was a specific book that triggered me at that time, but I certainly have many books that I love. Um, there was you know, <laughs> one of the books that I read when it came out, because a bookseller friend of mine, she managed a bookstore, handed it to me, was Twilight. And I thought, I was so impressed by what Stephanie Meyer accomplished with Twilight. And there were a lot of really good books around that time. Um, I, I can't remember who wrote it. Stray? I was a, about like a cat shapeshifter woman, and I was really into um, Laurel K. Hamilton's uh, Anita Blake series before, well, <laughs> I liked it for a long time. Uh, so it was all of those books, and I really loved that there was this combination of the fantastic, of really cool world building and magic with... Um, really fun sex and romance. And it was like totally my catnip. It was all hitting all my sweet spots. And so when I decided I didn't want to be a scientist and that actually my ideal life would be to be a writer, I started out writing essays. I wrote nonfiction, but then soon I started feeling like I wanted to write this blend of romance and fantasy. Okay, so let's see here. Grace Draven, I've seen your Pinterest board with all the great ideas for fashions Leah would wear. Leah is a serious clothes horse. Um, they're fabulous. Thank you, Grace. Did you enjoy the set dressing aspect of the book? Because when I read the book, I got the impression she sends a message with the beautiful, dignified, and glamorous garb she wears. She absolutely does. Uh, the outward expression of her rule for both her court and visitors to her court. The fashion is truly a statement, just not, not just of taste, but of politics. Was this purposeful on your part or something that came through inadvertently as you wrote? Um, it was purposeful. One of my inspirations, and I guess this I, I'd forgotten. One of my inspirations for this book was the movie Elizabeth, the Golden Age with Kate Blanchett. I was, I had rewatched it again, rewatched it again. How's that? Uh, I rewatched it when I was sort of brewing up the idea for this series. And I loved the way that Elizabeth used clothing as an armor as she, she the way she used it to sort of create this image of herself as queen, as ruler, 
in a way that she couldn't she couldn't be a man, but she could be fantastically striking, you know, with the tall collars and the big hair and those dresses. And, and the map room comes partly from that too. Uh, and then I love the contrast of when she was not in that very formal garb and she had was not wearing her wig she and she just had a scarf on her head and she would be alone and it would be just the woman and i really love the tension between that i love the difference between the person the woman who was very alone and the monarch that she strove to be so so yes i had a lot of fun with the dresses um i love clothes and makeup myself so it was fun to get to write and kind of um you know like have an excuse to write it because sometimes I think uh, those of us who are write more feminine science fiction and fantasy feel like we have to try not to dwell on things that are too feminine so it was really nice to have an excuse to play with clothes and makeup and my editor loves it she calls the books fashion porn and I, I do keep the Pinterest board. And when I had Leah going out for a new event and changing into something, I would go look at my Pinterest board and I would pick a look for her. And it would absolutely depend on her mood, both how she felt inside and what she wanted to portray. And sometimes those two, they, they leak differently. Um, those who know her well can tell when she's... Um, trying to cover how she feels or when what she feels is leaking through. Um, can you give us a hint of those other characters you'd like to revisit and focus on in subsequent books? So when you guys get to the end of the third book, The Promised Queen, you will have learned things, those are in capital letters, about Ambrose and Merle. And there are a lot of things in both directions, past and present, that I would like to explore with Ambrose and Merle. Uh, I, I don't feel like this is too spoilery, but Ebolia, one of Leah's ladies in waiting, um, ends up with a larger role. She starts to in the second book and she does in the third book. And I would like to follow Ebolia's journey. And also Sandra. Sandra is one of my favorite characters and I would, I have plans for Sandra. Um, and also Percy. You will, um, Percy, one of the courtiers turns out in the third book to have a more significant role in things. And I would enjoy following, Percy's fun anyway. Um, and I would enjoy following his story. Oh, Julie Fine is there. I'm glad you made it home safely from work, Julie. Um, both characters come from extremely challenging backgrounds, yes, and have been honed through circumstance to be very driven with respect to their end games, to respect to their respective end games. It seems to me that it would have been easy for Khan and Leah to end up cold and unlikable, yet you artfully engage, thank you, the reader, and make these characters not only likable, but people and a couple you root for. The character development, how hard was it to inject humanity into their sometimes single-minded paths? Hmm. How hard was it to do? It was hard. <laughs> I mean, I certainly worked at it. Um, I enjoy writing characters who are on the surface unlikable because of the ways in which they're driven. Driven, passionate people are interesting to me. But it is one of the challenges as a writer to make those people likable to the reader. And sometimes you don't know. You don't really know what readers are going to connect with and what they will find um, a bridge too far. So I think... Um, a lot of times the window into making an unlikable character feel human is to let the reader into their inner pain. Uh, and both Khan and Leah have um, a lot of inner pain. They cover it up very well, um, but in many ways, 
all of the things that they do to sort of control the world around them and to advance their passions, advance the things that they care about, stem from the fact that they're both very wounded inside. And I think we always kind of care about um, a person who has been hurt by the world. So it's sort of this um, letting the reader into, into seeing that hurt while still showing how they cover it up for the rest of the world. And it's one of the ways, one of the reasons I love romance and love writing relationships because they end up peeling that back in each other without really meaning to. And that's part of their um, progression towards intimacy and also the things that they have to give up in order to, I don't know, be more human, you know, that they have to kind of give up this toughness that they show the rest of the world um, in order to get along with each other. Hopefully that makes sense. Feel free to ask more. Um, what advice do you have for those trying to become writers? Uh, the, the best advice is the simple advice, which is to, to write a whole lot. Um, definitely read a whole lot. I, I feel like that goes without saying because most of us start, I think we all start as readers. Keep reading, but then write a whole lot. And just, just write. Don't worry about if it's good yet or what it is or what genre it is. I feel like one of the fallacies that new writers fall into, and I certainly did this, is that is putting it up for critique too soon because you want you want to make it into the thing. You want to know what's going to, what you need to do in order to fix it. And one of the luxuries that you have as uh, a newbie writer is that nobody's expecting anything from you. And it's really the whole time in your whole career that you can just write whatever you want uh, without without expectation and without burden or deadlines or any of that stuff. So if it's possible, write every day. Um, when I began, I resisted that advice for a very long time, but once I realized that I was not getting anywhere, that I had not, that I decided I was gonna be a writer, but I actually hadn't produced many words. Uh, and I started writing every day that cracked it open. Um, even if you can only write for like, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes every day, try to do that. If you can try to write at the same time every day, even if it's just like at your lunch hour or right before you go to bed or wake up a little bit early. I woke up, I started getting up very early before my day job because it was the only time I could write at the same time every day. And I started getting up at like four, 4.30 in the morning and I'm not a morning person. But that starts the flow and getting those words to flow is the most important thing you can do. Hi, JC. JC Jarvis says, I love the contrast between these characters and how they react differently to living under a tyrant. The subtext is so rich. Thank you. How much of that is organic to the story and how much do you put in intentional themes? Um, I don't do a whole lot. Uh, intentionally. <laughs> I, um, there are some things that, that I plant. I, I did want this to be the story of people living under a tyrant. And I did put this together um, in the days leading up to the 2016 U.S. election. <laughs> so that probably tells you a lot. And I was very interested in the different ways that people responded to um, the threat of authoritarianism and what it meant to post-election, how we adapted to that. Uh, but a great deal of that comes from the character because I do write for Discovery and I sort of ride around in the character's head. But then I do find the themes as I go. And once I find them, once they start appearing in the story, then I will go through and tweak it and I will um, bring it out more clearly in various places in the book. So even though I don't develop it ahead of time, I do definitely refine that in the revision process and 
and try to make those themes like, um, I'm not really a music person, but, you know, sort of like uh, certain musical threads that continue throughout the story, refrains that it comes back to. Uh, your world has so many interesting and beautiful aspects to it. If you had a day to spend in the world of this series, what would you go do or see? Um, well, Calanthe is definitely my, my idea of paradise. Um, so I would absolutely want to be on Calanthe. I sort of created as an amalgamation of various Caribbean islands that I've been to, and also just how I would imagine the most beautiful place to be with the flowers and everything. So yes, I would absolutely, um, I would like to see the waterfalls of flowers. I would like that to be real. I drew some of that from photos of various things, but then clearly there's there's like no such thing. It's what I thought the hanging gardens of that Babylon should have looked like. And then I've since discovered that they probably didn't look like that. But when I heard about hanging gardens of Babylon, I wanted them to be like waterfalls of flowers. Um, and I would go to the map room. <laughs> Let's see, what are you currently working on and on what can, what reads can we be on the lookout from you? So right now I have my other series, which is the 12 Kingdoms and the Uncharted Realms. Uh, that's been out for since, starting since um, 2014, so six years now, wow. And I recently finished The Fate of the Tala that came out in February, which tied up the whole Uncharted Realms arc, except for like one plot thread. And that is kind of the culmination of a spin-off trilogy called The Chronicles of Desneria. And that was Prisoner of the Crown, Exile of the Seas, Warrior of the World, uh, which went back in time and sort of told the origin story of one of the characters. And in the fate of the Tala, um, she is in there, but I didn't quite finish out her story. So right now I'm writing a novella called The Lost Princess Returns. And I'm hoping to have that. I'm, I'm self-publishing that. So it should be out in a couple of weeks. Well, awesome. Thank you so, so, so much for tonight. It was such a great pleasure getting to hear you talk about your books. And I think we all wish we now had a map room somewhere in our <laughs> homes because it just seems like life would be better with a map room. <laughs> I, I think so. I think we all need a map room. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for everyone for attending and all of your amazing and awesome questions. Don't forget if you would like to purchase a book and it'll come with a signed and personalized book plate, make sure that you click the link that we've got right up there for you guys. And thank you so much for coming for tonight's event. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone.